welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your chat or had a walk outside and enjoyed some, enjoyed some nice weather. Um, let's continue with our program. So, I know it's kind of ridiculous, but let's have a quick show of hands. Who has used Interleaf in their production code within the past five years? Tricky question, right? Without looking. Um, so, uh, while researching this, uh, this talk and this speaker that we're going to see next, I found that she had an insight that she found in a real use case to use Interleaf just this April. And I, looked, and I went back to my production code and I had to go back as far as eight years to find the one single use of Interleaf that I had. Um, interesting insight. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Jordan has a reagent repos repository out there on GitHub, which is built using a make file. Can you believe that? I love that. And she's currently working on establishing a YouTube channel uh, for closure and programming in general. So please, once again, wiggle the avatar in Gather.Town for Jordan Miller. And get push. <sighs> Time to relax. Ring, ring. What's that? Hello? Prod? Prod who? Prod's down? Oh no! Oh, I can fix this. I can fix this. I'm just... Rep on in. Def and test. Object G3725. I know. I'll just print it. Oh no. Um, the console know what to do with this. Oh no. Python debugger? Oh no. Oh god. Oh no, if only I had known. If only I had known. If only I had read Sussman. Howdy folks. I'm Jordan, aka Lambda. And I'm here to help protect you from the situation you just saw. I'm going to do so using some powerful techniques adapted from Software Designed for Flexibility, a book recently released from the MIT Press that I've been fondly calling the SICP Ghoul. First, we're going to implement one of Sussman's techniques called Generic Procedures in ClojureScript. Then I'm going to combine this generic procedure with Clojure's built-in implementation of this abstraction, multi-methods. Finally, I'm going to share some spicy thoughts, advocating for the use of an adapted data-driven design principle when working in reactive applications. I want to kill the horrible practice of passing in functions as props into components. We'll start with a few disclaimers. I've selected just one of many techniques to demonstrate here today. I feel it's one of the more accessible ones. It's in chapter three, and it was even covered in the former work of Sussman from MIT in SICP. So our intended audience here today is intermediate ClojureScript developers. So if you're already a pro, some of this might be review for you. And if you've never touched ClojureScript, some of this may not make sense, but luckily these strategies are semantically extensible. You don't always have a choice in the languages you're working in. It'd be super great if you always had a compiler checking your types for you or a step through debugger. But luckily these techniques are applicable to any language that supports functional abstractions, even Python. In fact, when I do write Python, I write a weird functional version that kind of looks a lot like this. The Python kids think I'm kind of weird, but I just tell them, try closure. All right, remember this? This is what can happen when you pass a function into a component. And it's really easy and tempting to do, especially if you're new to these concepts. We pass functions into map, we pass functions into filter. Why not pass functions into components? And if you come from a React background, passing functions in as props is even considered best practice. We got into this situation 
because trying to do exactly that. The reason I feel as though these methods are less preferred in a ClojureScript application compared to a React app is because why would we throw away our biggest advantage? Which in my personal opinion is observability of the data via REPL driven development. Otherwise, why not just use TypeScript or JavaScript where you can just find the answer and copy paste in working code from Stack Overflow, not have to deal with the tooling at all. So how do we get the advantages of ClojureScript while maintaining the flexible dynamic abilities of higher order functions passed into components? Can we have our cake and eat it too? Allow me to introduce you to Sussman's generic procedures. A generic procedure is a function that can handle many different types of data. And you may have heard me say types. Well, how does this work in a dynamically typed language like Clojure or Python or Ruby? Well, to quote the OG SICP, in particular, we introduced data-directed programming as a technique to allow for individual data representations to be designed in isolation and then combined additively, i.e. without modification. The important thing to note here is the word additively. So instead of a giant con statement, we will favor runtime dynamic behavior. And that way we get the advantages of extensibility at runtime, AKA in your REPL. Functional polymorphism. The key advantage of generic procedures is functional polymorphism. Sounds complicated, it's not. We can illustrate this conceptually with the addition operator in Python. Notice they combine integers, strings, or really any data structures for which the plus operator is already defined. Here we see an example with the list. Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy in all languages? More advanced developers may recognize that this behavior can be accomplished with a protocol-based dispatch, but we're gonna discuss variations in behavior even within the same data type, such as hash maps with different and changing values. This quality is especially important in the wild world of web development, and you'll see why shortly. So to demonstrate this concept, I'm going to use a real world example from the company where I work currently, OmniWay. We are a San Francisco based startup with a small distributed remote team, AWS on the back end, closure script and reframe on the front end. And if you don't know, reframe and reagent are just wrappers on JavaScript React. Part of our product includes an in-browser shopper app. The shopper app allows shoppers to purchase projects, products from luxury brands directly from the live stream event. Looks kind of like this, kind of like QVC, but way better and marketed towards luxury retailers. So Marnie, All Saints, Valentino, that sort of things. We need to have a tight looking application. Feature development. <laughs> Flexibility requires good architecture from the ground up. It is a lot harder to add on an extra floor to building after the fact than it is to just build it with insertable floors. It's probably why I'm a software engineer instead of a civil engineer. So have you ever gotten a feature request that started off kind of looking like this? As we all know, in the fast paced land of startup, feature development and requests are constantly evolving. Tickets and features are always living documents. Add in a remote team from different time zones, from California to the East Coast, all the way to India. You need to be able to develop features in a way that is flexible, extensible, composable, and maintainable, because this can very easily turn into this over the course of a two hour meeting. Were you even there? Did you even see the Gmail invite? So the initial ask for this was to create an RSVP flow to enable shoppers to sign up for alerts, add to calendar, share to social media. 
Some of the goals is we wanted to ask as little info as possible so we can increase event entry because nobody likes it when you ask for a bunch of creepy information. We also wanted to be able to pre-populate the information where applicable. So if we know your email, we want to fill it in for you. Make it as seamless an experience as possible. A good product manager turned that flowchart into this guiding light ticket in the epic. So we're going to start with the RSVP page UI1, this view. Because we do reframe, this is kind of an idea of the data we have to work with. But because we're keeping this abstract for, from any framework, I've pulled it out and hard coded the values for you. This is in a what you see is what you get sort of fashion. Normally, the values of this hash map would be populated via reactive functions, depending on the user's page state. So this is a form two component. And when the values of this data change, this function is going to be rerun based on that change. Digging into the inner function here. In our let, we have the generic function implementation I'm about to build up and share shortly. This generic procedure looks at the data and simply returns a keyword. Then in the body, we'll use that keyword to render the current view using a multi-method. Some viewers may be wondering why we need generic components at all when we already have closure multi-methods. Well, because dealing with a situation like this, you'd just be shifting the burden of the conditional logic to the dispatch function of the multi-method. You then become a victim of your own complexity. I hear we're gonna hear more on that shortly. Hi, Bug. So we're victims are on complexity. We've somehow made a nested conditional logic more complex by adding a useless multiple dispatch layer on top of it. But you feel pretty slick though, huh? Well, I don't care how slick it makes you feel. You've just moved the burden over. You haven't solved the problem. There's even a word, special word for this, cyclomatic complexity. Remember our goal is to avoid bucks. Ugh. No big ugly con statements, which then every time something changed, you would have to rewrite. This quickly becomes a source of bugs and a maintainability nightmare. So how are we going to solve this? Generic functions. These are actually initially introduced in the OG SICP, and then they're greatly expanded upon and reiterated in the SICP goal. It's almost as though we didn't get it the first time around. All right, our generic function implementation. Let's dig into this bad boy. So this little buddy, this is a simple generic procedure in ClojureScript. First, we will use an atom to keep track of the registered views. And we tuck it in a let just to avoid it being exposed globally. This is a matter of personal taste. I just don't like globally namespace states like flopping around the namespace. All right, our first function, register view. We'll take a keyword and a predicate function and simply adds it to the, adds it to the atom. That's it. We're only adding things to the atom. We're not taking things out. Now map current view. This chick is the backbone of the operation here. She looks at the data and returns the first view key in the registry whose predicate is satisfied. Now keep in mind, keywords are not the only way to implement generic procedures. But register view is deliberately designed to have a visually similar API to death method, as you'll see shortly. So remember this, that mess of possible different views. So each view corresponds with the page view in a product narrative. Each product narrative corresponds with the page state. Each page state could be represented with a hash map. Each hash map will be converted by map current view that awesome chick in the last function and return a keyword. So adding a new page view is as simple as registering a new view function with register view. 
Here we see an example of view register in action. Notice the visual similarity between register view and def method. Register view takes a keyword and a predicate function as an argument. Some of you may already be connecting the dots that this is a way to create a multi-method dispatch function with runtime dynamic behavior instead of a big ugly con statement. All right, so that was easy. We've implemented a generic procedure. And now we'll see how to accomplish dynamic page views by combining this with the flexible multi-method dispatch function with closures built in multi-methods. So we've taken our data, we've passed it to a generic function, and in that generic function, which is map current view, it takes the data and just spits back a keyword. Now we're going to wire up the generic procedure as the dispatch function to the component multi-method to render a page view. Hopefully you're familiar with def multi and def method. Here you can see we register the function current view and based on the keyword passed into the argument, render a different page view. In fact, each multi-method as seen here returns a reagent component that renders a page view for our OmniWay application. All right, this isn't a reagent talk, but just super briefly, the square brackets are important. They are hiccup syntax. They are used to visually identify components as separate from data functions. And it forces delayed evaluation of the component. So it can be dynamically re-rendered by reagent in responses to changes from data. Remember that form two component? If that didn't make sense, don't worry about it and just check out the reframe docs for more information. All you need to know is that these values in square brackets render a page view. Note the RSVP public keyword in the associated component, which results in the page view here. Ta-da! This resulted because our state data was converted by the map current view function in our generic procedure to the keyword RSVP public. This is because it satisfied the predicate function for RSVP public. That results in the RSVP public keywords being bound to the current view key symbol. This causes our current view multi method to dispatch to the RSVP public view along with the data payload. So what are the benefits here? Seems like a lot. You get new requirements for product, another page view. You just add another view to the registry. All right, maybe this sounds like a lot. And perhaps for only a couple of views, a con statement would totally suffice. I've heard this referred to as freshman dispatch, and it's very suitable for freshman problems. But for dynamic high churn code, we need a more sophisticated approach. This is MIT, baby. It only took us 14 lines of code to implement this much, much smaller than the big ugly con statement that it would take to implement the 15 plus eventually cases required for the final product. So in software design for flexibility, there is a quote, this kind of extension is dangerous, but if we are careful, we can make old programs have new abilities without losing their old abilities. Yeah, sometimes all you need is a cond, but when it's a sophisticated problem and sophisticated feature, you need to break out the bad boys at MIT. All right, back to our techniques. We've implemented a generic procedure and combined it with a multi-method to return a component. Now I'll show you how to solve the problems we encountered earlier using the techniques we just learned. 
we turn our attention to the original problem. Remember this? The problem was that a function was passed in as an argument to a component. Just say no. Using the techniques we've learned, it will hopefully be obvious that there is never a need to do this. It's just as easy to pass in a keyword or a hash map as it is passed through a function. Do you want to break prod? Because that's how you break prod. Instead, we will use a data-driven approach. So what do I mean by a data-driven approach? I mean, keep your data as data. Integers, strings, booleans, even better. Keywords, lists, hash maps. Don't pass through functions. Well, wait a minute. In Clojure, fun functions are pure data, Jordan. Well, yeah, you're right, technically. The rules are a little bit different in ClojureScript, though. We don't have things like status, static code analysis, type checking, the code navigation. You can't just MX jump to source on the onclick function. There's not really a useful step through debugger. And you saw how functions looked in the REPL, right? And you don't even want to know how JavaScript handles nil. I'll give you a hint. Super willy nilly about it. It is the wild west out here, y'all. So if you do something like this and leave a breadcrumb trail of functions in your data, passing them as props to components, then sooner or later you'll find yourself in this situation, which very, mal which, which very well may lead to this situation. Dun, dun, dun. So how do we fix it? Leave your data as observable values. Set yourself up with a nice layer cake of abstraction to then handle the values. If you do it well enough, you may even be able to recycle this abstraction cake in other projects. Instead of passing through the function, pass through the data in what you want to do and then set up a multi-method on the end to actually do the function. So, stateful functions passed into component as props, no go. But data in props used by generic functions, yeah, yeah, I like it. So we've done all this today. We've implemented Sussman's generic procedures in ClojureScript. We've combined with ClojureScript's built-in, well, closures, built-in multi-methods to render a closure component based on data. And I've told you why you want to use a data-driven approach, especially while working in ClojureScript. Couple more tips. Doc strings. I once heard a quote. Hell is other people's abstractions. Be a nice coworker. If you're going to do this, document what you're doing. Follow your thinking. This kind of just goes for all your code. Also, keep a flexible mind. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. This is one of many techniques that you should keep in your wheelhouse and apply where necessary. Sometimes a cond is all that's needed. In those cases, just use that. All right, I look forward to talking to y'all in the Q&A and thank you for having me, Closure D. I'd also like to thank and shout out to everybody at OmniWay, Rob, Icy, Abik, Ram, our QA team, Swaba and Nisha, and the people turning all those flowcharts into tickets, Laura and Amitab. Thank y'all. Now, if you enjoy this and you're wondering what's up with this girl with pink hair talking about closure, get out your phone, Scan the QR code. That's all the places you can find me being funny and laughing and learning and nerdy. And there's a YouTube channel. There's a podcast. It's going to be great, y'all. You can email me. Check out my website, Twitter. Let's, let's jam. Let's talk. All right. Thank you. Bye. And here we are. Thank you. Thank you for this very entertaining talk.
It was a pleasure listening to it. Um, also, it was it was a, such a pleasure to uh, re research you as a speaker uh, before because I got the pleasure to watch your other video, YouTube videos before. Uh, I really like that. Um, so, given that we have now a conference which is kind of unusual, um, and and you had the chance to work on your on your talk before, and then maybe you know I don't know cut it later um, and video edit it. Did you do you feel like you have everything in there, or is there anything you would like to add now? with the uh... so uh yeah no absolutely not it's funny i i created a lot of the content for this talk early on in the feature development as i was kind of creating the scaffolding for the feature and um it was it was really great scaffolding because it was very easy to plan very easy to conceptualize but um you know after i recorded it and made this content i then worked on the feature worked with product and i think there ended up being um 20 plus different states um, that needed to render. And, you know, the implementation changed um, pretty significantly. And, you know, I, I just have to say that I am super glad that I used a data-driven data design because when I was going through iterations with the QA team, you know, they would test one state and say, hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't going the way it does. You know, this isn't going... We have an error on this page state. Um, as I, say, I was able to just print the data and match the data to the predicate function, like true, true, false, false. Yeah, and it was very easy to, um, you know, go through those iterations with QA. Oh, hi, peanut butter. That is that is my puppy. He, I'm sure we all know. We all know about that. Life these days, right? We all have puppies and cats and horses walking to something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's cool. Um, during during the talk, some people were quite amazed or, or um, said that the book chart you put on one of the slides was pretty impressive. Now, you uh, so read them all to the very end. <laughs> <laughs> no, all of those books. No, I, I. Um... I wish I, I wish I did. I wish I was that, um, God, even, I mean, I'm getting through a strange loop right now yeah. and, you know, I, I got halfway through, um, Gertel Escher and Bach and it was like, Oh, strange loop. Okay. I'll just do this. Instead. <laughs> and so, um, and I hadn't, I haven't actually read the Anne Rand books. I just, you know, pop, popular culture is, um, and I mean, I have read SICP and I'm not completely through the SICP equal yet. Um, it does seem to be a lot of the same concepts, and part of why I wanted to create the content for this talk was um, because to motivate me to um, really dig in and get through it because, uh, you know, I find doing these things very motivating and rewarding and makes me happy. So, um, but yeah, that feel free to meme that. That's a pretty good meme. <laughs> More like the, the, the typical um, computer science uh, career. <laughs> Have them on your shelf, maybe, but only a very rare uh, but it's very rare that people actually get them through the network. We have questions over here in uh, the Closure Deep Slack channel. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is from Pets, and mm -hmm. he asked, what happens if several predicate functions return true? So that is a really good question. Um, so the order of which of, of the order of your register view functions does matter. So the first predicate that returns true, that's the page state that's going to render. And that is, um, as I said, I was going through these iterations with QA and, and working and trying trying to get this right. Um, you know, that is one of the, um, I want to say pitfalls. It's one of the things that happened is if I didn't realize that um, maybe the one of the earlier um, predicate functions had m m looser conditions. Um, and so it would accidentally hit that one first. And I'd be like, why is, why is this, why is this page state coming up? Clearly this other predicate function is, you know, this specific case. Um, so you, so you want to aim to make things as explicit and detailed as you possibly can. You don't want to leave like, you know, very open-ended uh, register views early in that, um, you know, uh, have them first. If you do have, you want to try to not have them at all, but if you do have them, you want to have them later on, kind of as a catch-all, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, hope that answers your the question. Um, maybe a bit similar um, or a bit broad, 
broader in scope is uh, from Dominic M. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say that passing reframe events around would be an implement implementation of this system that you described in your talk? I think that you would probably fall victim to, because the reason this design works is because of the observability, as I said in the talk, that's really the advantage of that. And when you're passing around, you know, events, events are more observable than just raw functions. Um, I haven't tried it. I'm sure there's a way you could do it. Um, but the point is to really pass around observable, viewable data. So you can just see exactly, and actually that was something, um, the last commit I made before we got the final from QA and push to prod was um, I deleted, I ended up putting a print line statement and printing the data as is um, of the components that were rendering just in the view um, so I was able, so if anything didn't match, I was able to just see, does that match? Does that match? I was able to match it up and you don't really get the advantage. I don't, I wouldn't think you would get the advantage of that with events. Um, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm sure there's a way it can be done. Um, I just haven't done it. Okay. So over here in the chat, I can see that people in general agree to that the bookshelf is good, but not really going through all of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, that's it in, in terms of questions that we find mm -hmm. uh, from the audience so far. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, is that the call to interleave, is that still in your production code? <laughs> the, I'm so, oh no, I thought, like I said, that was the, la the last commit I made was I got the sanity check, um, the sanity check from QA. Um, the way we do it is we have I have my personal dev environment and then we have, you know, we have, we have a lot of different, I got the say, so deleted that print line statement, pushed it to QA. I commented it out though. And it's funny when it went through code review, somebody was like, you should really delete those. I'm like, uh, uh we ain't done with this. This, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not the last time some data is coming, going to come out funky. Let's, let's, let's wait till this isn't touched for like two weeks. Then I'll, then I'll completely delete those, uh, those lines instead of commenting out. <laughs> During, during research for this talk, I found, I forgot where it was that you referenced that you finally, you were quite, I think it was on Twitter, maybe, you mm -hmm. were quite proud to say, hey, I finally found a use case for interleave. And no, I, I did Oh, no. oh my God. So turns out, um, ended up just using string instead of interleave. <laughs> So it was uh, that's what I like to call a programmer move using the most complex. I've been trying to use interleave for years though. I'm telling you, it's, if anybody has been able to use, you know, really justify um, that casually, I'd, I'd love to uh, I'll live vicariously through you. <laughs> oh, dear audience, this is a call to action. Share with us <laughs> your calls to interleave. This is uh, the topic. <laughs> I love it because it's great for uh, for like, you know, code challenges, you know, different algorithms, but like I just, a real world use case, there's always a simpler, I always seem to find a simpler and better and more, I guess, idiomatic way to do instead of using, instead of using that particular function, so. Would be nice to be able to measure all the users just out there, but then again, maybe it's not nice after all. Um, last question, maybe. Uh, what do you plan to do with your with your YouTube channel? Do you expand plan to expand on that, or are you working on something else right now? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so YouTube channel is well. I was focusing on this for a while, and I've actually been focusing on releasing a podcast now. The first one was with Bork Dude, who I understand gave a talk earlier that was awesome. It was like four in the morning where I live, so I didn't wasn't able to catch it. I'm sorry, but I will review it. Um, but I've been focusing on a podcast and I have a couple um, episodes that I had recorded, but I wasn't able to release them until after this conference. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. There will be some announcements made in the next couple talks. Um, so shortly in the next couple of weeks, I will be dropping a couple more podcast, um, podcast, podcast episodes. And if I'm able to figure out the editing, um, those will also be going to my YouTube. Um, Still, yeah, in life, or you move to Blender? <laughs> I, 
I, I, I want to use, um, is it F, FGMPEG? I, I might get that, that acronym wrong, but. Yeah, um, I think we're getting kind of distracted here. Um, oh, so yes. Once again, thanks for, for preparing the talk for us and, and sending it over here. Um, mm -hmm. I hope everybody was uh, enjoying it and I'm pretty, pretty confident they did. And uh, when you plan to watch uh, Michiel's talk, uh, that's mm -hmm. gonna be live coding from scratch. So it's also kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, uh, dear audience, please once again, uh, move your avatar quickly around in, uh, in, in Gather Town as a virtual form of applause for today. Thank you, John. Thank you.